When your car is broken too, there's only one thing you wanna do. Open your mouth and let it spew. But I am telling you, stay positive. When you're baking a cake for your family, and your kids are hopped up on caffeine, your fluffy cake is now kinda lean. Remember, don't be mean, stay positive. When your bank account is close to red, you want to cry yourself to bed. It could be worse, you could be dead. Remember what I said, stay positive. Part six, stay positive. Who's having a good day so far? Man, I just, man, that worship team, they're just awesome, aren't they? I'm so thankful for them leading us into God's presence. There's like two people that clap for that. Come on, we're better than that. How about that worship team, huh? That's right. That's right. Hey, I want to say hello to our church online family like I do every single week. We're so glad that uh, we have the ability for you to join us uh, online. I know so many of you are taking care of yourself and waiting for the vaccine and all those different things. So we're so thankful we have the ability to stay connected in this way. All of us that are here in the house, we're just so thankful that you're with us Today, I've got just a couple quick things before we dive into the message today. Uh, next week, we're starting a brand new series that's going to carry us all the way through the end of April. It's called God of Miracles. We're just going to park ourselves right at the feet of Jesus for these next several weeks. It's our lead up to Easter Sunday. It's the greatest thing in the world. I love Easter Sunday. I know there's so many jokes about it being Super Bowl Sunday for churches and all those different things. But uh, seriously, it's the greatest miracle, and I'm so excited that we get to celebrate that. Speaking of Easter, hey, we've had such great feedback from you on our Easter survey. Uh, one of the reasons why we were trying to solicit some information, get some feedback from you about Easter is because of our capacities in our kids' spaces. Uh, we're actually making the call because so many of you are starting to come back and make plans to be back on Easter Sunday. We're going to do two services on Easter Sunday at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. Uh, here's what we're asking. We're asking you to register for that. Because of the capacity limits, we need to know who's coming at what service. So you can go to connect.reallifechurch.net. The very first thing you'll see on that page uh, is an Easter registration button. You tap that. Just let us know what service you're coming, how many kids are coming. And we're going to have a great time. I already know the weather's going to be awesome on Easter Sunday. Uh, like, look at it outside today. It's perfect. And we're going to have a great time. We're going to have some special things in between services so we can stay connected even though we're doing it twice. It's going to be a great Day And one last thing, uh, in real life news, you saw the update about our vision night happening on March 28th, and I want to put in front of you one more time, it's our, we're now going into week two of our two weeks of prayerful consideration for our elders and our new trustees. And so put in front of you once again, Dave Dwanyan has been asked to serve as an elder. So continue to pray over Dave and Christy and uh, their family as they join us in that. And we'll affirm them at the business meeting. And then also we have uh, Eric Cook and Lori Dittmer joining us as trustees. And so we'll affirm them as well. How that prayerful consideration works is, is really simple. Pray over those families. And if anything comes up as you look at the qualifications for either an elder or a trustee, we'd ask you to go and have a conversation with them, and then we'll affirm them at Vision Night. I'm so excited for that. Well, what's been the conversation for these last several weeks? You know, it's a kind of a grim anniversary. One year ago on this Sunday is when we had to go into our lockdown and do all online services. What have we learned? It's easy to be negative, right? It's easy to be negative. It doesn't take extra effort on our part to go to unhealthy places. But because we're becoming fully devoted followers of Christ, we've learned that we don't have to stay in those unhealthy places. That's been the conversation here in Stay Positive. The theme verse, I want to put this in front of you again one more time. I, I read it myself this morning, and I just love the header for Proverbs 3 in my Bible where it says, wisdom brings well-being. I love that there's this amazing connection between well-being and health. The writer writes this, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own 
understanding. In all your ways, we're not compartmentalizing different sections of our life. In all of your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. And I love verses 7 and 8 because he goes on and talks about what health looks like. He says, don't be wise in your own eyes. Like, that's, a, that's an important statement. We're going to talk about that today. Fear the Lord and shun evil, and this will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. There's so much humility in those two verses of bringing your lives under the authority of Jesus. And if you're like me, it's so easy when things are going poorly to try and take control. Who else? Who, who, where are my friends in the room today, right? Taking control. Come on. It's what we do, right? Things are out of control. I got to squeeze harder and try and make it work. We wind up telling God inadvertently, why don't you go have a seat on the bench? Because I got this figured out. That's kind of the unintended consequence of trying to take control and do things our own way. We tell God unintentionally that we don't need you when the opposite is true. We, we build up a false confidence in ourselves. And that's what I want to talk about today. I want us to unpack some scriptures and look at reasons why we can truly be confident. I've titled our message today, It's Not a Problem. It's not a problem because I'm confident. Will you join me uh, in standing as we read God's word together this morning? I actually want to, I told you in, very, in the very first week of this series that there's so much in Proverbs 3, I could spend all of our time here, but I want to read just a few verses out of Proverbs 3 over us this morning for our time in God's word. I'm going to read verses 21 through 26 this morning, and the words will be on the screen for you to follow along. My son, do not let wisdom and understanding out of your sight. Preserve sound judgment and discretion. They will be life for you, an ornament to grace your neck. Then you will go on your way in safety, and your foot will not stumble. When you lie down, you won't be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Have no fear of sudden disaster or the ruin that under, overtakes the wicked, for the Lord will be at your side, and he will keep your foot from being snared. Let's pray together over our time in God's word. Lord, we just welcome you into this moment. This is all about you anyways. From the first moment of worship all the way through this time now as we go to your word, Lord, what we're looking for is a connection with you. So Holy Spirit, have your way right here in this moment, because it is all about you, and we pray that in your name. And everyone said amen. 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 I want you to type amen in the chat or give the little hands up emoji, high, air high five someone here in the room. Man, I'm so excited that we get to be together today and go to God's word. I say it all the time. I know I do. I love this moment. I love this moment when we get to hear God speak to us this moment. Years ago, um, I was going through some, some, just some coaching and some different things, and I did the, the, the Clifton Strengths Finder assessment. Anyone ever do the, the Gallup Strengths Finder thing? Do you still remember your top five? Yeah, I love it. My, my, my top five are this. They're strategy and ideation. What that means is I love to get the big picture view of what's going on. I love to get creative. And then I love to hand those things over to somebody else so I don't have to get mired down in the details about those things. But my, the, the remainder of my three that get round out are communication. And then my fourth one is positivity. Positivity, and then my fifth one is belief. And uh, I've been, this is the message, believe it or not, as I think about all these things, I've been crafting my way through this series. This is the message I've least wanted to teach because confidence, believe it or not, confidence is one of my weakest areas. And maybe you're like me and that resonates with you too. I don't think many of you know this, but at times I wrestle with crippling self-doubt. Anybody else in the room here? Like analysis paralysis, I don't want to make the wrong decision. Like crippling self-doubt. It doesn't take much for me to start second-guessing myself. Or thoughts like this, well, I'm, I'm not really good enough. Or I'm falling short. I'm not meeting expectations of my wife, of my family, of the, the elders, of my team, of my God. What, can it, what does it take to trigger some of those insecurities? Maybe you'll resonate with some of these with me. 
that vague text. You know what I'm talking about? Whoa. Well, what does that mean? And you start ruminating, right? That weird comment on your social media post. Well, what did that, what did that mean? A laugh or a glance on the other side of the room. Like, y'all have no idea standing up here. I hear a snicker back there. Or I'll see someone, like, whisper to somebody else over there. And in my head, I'm like, are they talking about me? That wasn't meant to be funny. Why are they laughing at me? There's few kids in the room, so I can say this. I have this moment of panic when someone laughs. It's like, is my fly unzipped right now? It got really uncomfortable just then, didn't it? In fact, thank you. Someone's got my back. You're good. Uh, thanks for checking, <laughs> question mark. In fact, can I, I'll say this. In fact, some of my most crippling self-doubt moments happen in the few minutes before I come out to do this. I'm standing backstage in the dark. I've got my hand on my sign that I showed you a few weeks ago that reads, it's a privilege to be on this stage. Thank you for choosing me. And I start hearing these whispers in the dark corners of my head saying things like, who are you that you should be speaking to these people? In fact, I was, not many of you know this, I was actually fired from my first ministry position. Fired, like outright, full on, you're done. Pack up and go. And I still have PTSD from it because anytime someone says a phrase that's similar to what brought me into the office to get fired, I start freaking out. Hey, we need to have a conversation. Boom, I'm done. What's happening? I'm getting fired. Like, I still have PTSD from that moment. I know that it's not true in my head, but that broken default is really, really loud. So we're going to do it one more time. We've done this for the last several weeks. We're going to do the scale of 1 to 10. Who's ready to get uncomfortable here? Scale of 1 to 10, we're talking about confidence. Again, we'll cut ourselves some slack. You're, you're probably not a 1 all the way over here on any of these things. But let's analyze ourselves well and say, well, we're probably not a 10 all the way over here, okay? So we're somewhere between 2 and 9. Let's talk about what's healthy. Okay, so am I a people pleaser all the way over here? Like, I'll do whatever just to keep, keep the peace and not cause any waves? Or am I over here standing strong in my identity? I know my role. I know who I am. I know how I've been called. Okay, that's one. How about this one? Are you a pushover and you just let people walk all over you? Or do you have good, strong, healthy boundaries over here? Somewhere probably between two and nine, right? How about this one? This one's uncomfortable. If you're over here on the lower end, do you fish for compliments? Are you seeking approval? Or are you way over here on this other side where you have the ability to honor others. It got quiet. Online, it got quiet in the room. How about this one? If you're way over here on this side of the scale, do you wear a mask? Do you never show people the real you? Do you put on a facade? Do you play a role? Or are you way over here, or do you give people what you think they want? Or are you way over here and you're honest and you're authentic and you're genuine? This one's kind of a weird one, but this one kind of resonates with me. Are you a one-upper? Like, do you have to have the last word? Do you have to have the best story? Do you have to have the loudest comment on social media? Do you have to be right? Or are you over here on the healthy side where you can defer to others? Are you deferential? Those are uncomfortable, aren't they? Scale of 1 to 10, how uncomfortable are we right now? And then to get right down to it, not to put too fine a point on it, are you insecure or are you confident? All of these things, especially the negative side, the negative side, the two to four side, those are things that rob us of being confident because they tell us so loudly that we can't do something, that we shouldn't put ourselves out there, that we don't have anything to contribute, that our stories disqualify us from God using us in a powerful way. 
And what's so sad is that when we believe that lie, we rob ourselves of a beautiful calling that Jesus has for us. And part of that calling is him demonstrating his strength through our weaknesses. What does it mean to be confident? That's what we're talking about. We're talking about the difference between these healthy defaults and our sinful, broken defaults. This new identity in Jesus. Having confidence in God means living life in a completely new way, depending on his strength to handle life, to handle challenges. It's really not about your strengths, your talents, your abilities, your gifts. It's not about the confidence that you put into earthly things, and we put so much time and energy into these things, don't we? It's not about money. It's not about possessions. It's not about sex. It's not about power. It's not about control. It's not about education. It's not about appearance. Instead, it's about placing trust and confidence in the work that Jesus is doing in us, that he works in us to make us more like him, that he demonstrates his goodness to us, his faithfulness to us, that he never fails us. Maybe I'd say it this way if you're taking notes. Maybe I'd write this down. We don't need to build our self-confidence. We need to build our God confidence. We don't need to build our self. The world doesn't need more self-confident people. We don't need to be full of ourselves. We need to be full of Jesus. We need to build our God confidence. It's part of the conversation that Paul has in 1 Corinthians with his readers there. He's, he's reminding them of the sins of Israel's past. And it's so easy for us to do the same thing. We'll read through the Old Testament and we're like, man, these guys got it so wrong. I can't believe just over and over and over and over how they got it wrong. They got it wrong. They got it wrong. And Paul's giving them a warning. Hey, you, you are susceptible to the exact same thing. You're boasting in yourselves. Look what he says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. These are all warning markers, talking about the story of Israel. These are all warning markers, danger in our history books, written down so that we don't repeat their mistakes. Our positions in the story are parallel. They happen to be at the beginning of the story and we at the end. What's his point? And we are just as capable of messing it up as they were. Well, where's the, where's the self-confidence? Look what he goes on in verse 12. He says, don't be so naive and self-confident. You're not exempt. That's part of our flaw, is we think we're exempt. Well, that'll never happen to us. That it might apply to you, like you nudge your neighbor as you're sitting in the sermon. You really need to listen to this. You're not exempt. You could fall flat on your face as easily as anyone else. Forget about self-confidence. It's useless. Cultivate God confidence. A healthy measure of confidence is not a problem. But where it becomes a problem is when we start thinking that we're the ones who are taking care of everything. It's the, I'm going to polish my star and oh, I'm having such a hard time reaching my, and getting myself on the back. Right? We start patting ourselves on the back. How do we combat that? How do we develop healthy confidence? How do we keep godly wisdom and understanding fear of the Lord in front of us? Well, we're going to be confident in Jesus. Let me just give you three quick reasons why we're going to say that I'm confident. Number one, I'm confident because Jesus has called me his own. I'm confident because Jesus called me his own. Like In all seriousness, this entire series has been centered around just one thing, reframing circumstances through the reality of Jesus. Why do I keep talking about this? Because our circumstances have been so loud during this season. Our confidence isn't based on circumstances. It's based on Jesus. That's the starting and ending point right there. Jesus. As Christians, our confidence isn't based on the things that we've done, our own accolades. Because Jesus did something for us that we could never do for ourselves. It's how we stand in the face of a culture that screams to get our way. Jesus did something that we never could, and so we model ourselves after Jesus. We look to his life, and we don't see him bending to culture. 
We don't see Jesus change his approach to try and fit in. We see Jesus stand firm and love well in a culture that constantly is compromising because he knew who he was. I am my father's son, right? He knew who he was. He was confident in that. It was quiet confidence that didn't scream back. One of the most powerful things someone said to me once was this, meekness is not weakness. Jesus isn't weak because he's meek. So how do we stand with confidence in a culture that's completely full of compromise? How do we hold firm in our mission, our purpose, and our beliefs? Not with a swagger, not with a posture that says we're better than others, that I've got it all figured out and you don't, not by angrily screaming back at culture because those are the kinds of people that Jesus confronted, right? Those are the people that Jesus confronted, the religious people that thought they had it all figured out. Instead, we stand in confidence because of what Jesus did. That temptation is to be proud, and that's the trap. That's the trap. I did this. We did this. Look at me. Didn't take anyone. Jesus, I got to figure it out. Go have a seat. Paul, Saul, Saul the persecutor, he had every reason to boast. He had it all figured out. He was the religious guy. Based on religion, Paul had it all figured out. And Jesus came and totally changed his life. And what did he say about boasting? What did he say about confidence? Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, God has united you with Jesus Christ. For our benefit, God made him to be wisdom itself. Christ made us right with God. He made us pure and holy, and he freed us from sin. That's what Jesus did. That's what he did that we could never do for ourselves. Therefore, why is the there, therefore? (laughs) Sorry, I love that. (laughs) It's just my favorite thing ever. Therefore, because of all of that, as the scriptures say, if you want to boast, boast only about the Lord. Boast only about the Lord. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done so that none of us can boast. I'm confident, not because I've done something or taken care of business myself, I'm confident because Jesus has called me his own. If you're taking notes, number two, I'm confident because I have people walking with me. I have people going with me on this journey. I'm not by myself. I say this almost every week. Pastor Taylor says it almost every week. You'll never convince me that we're meant to do life alone. Never, ever, ever, never. Life is better together is more than just slick marketing for a program of small groups Life groups aren't meant to pack your calendar full of events. Instead, it's meant to facilitate the relationships that you were actually designed for. When we struggle, when circumstances become overwhelming, when we don't have the strength to stand on our own, when we're feeling weak and isolated and afraid, if we have solid, godly people who we've allowed in and we've been vulnerable and we've taken off the mask, and we're genuine and let people in and know our story, we can be confident because they're walking right alongside of us in our story. Here's a great scripture. I love this one. It's every Christian athlete's favorite scripture ever. You know where I'm going, right? I just say that, you know where I'm going. Philippians chapter 4, verse verse 13. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Jesus loves me so I can hit a 100 mile an hour fastball. That's what that means. No, that's not what Paul's talking about. It's good. This is a great verse. But what's the story? What's the story here with this verse? What's the context in the book of Philippians? Do you remember? Paul's in prison. Paul's in prison. He's suffered from shipwrecks. He's been poisoned. He's been bitten by snakes. He's been beaten to the point of death. And yet he says he can do everything through Christ. What's he doing? He's writing back and forth with a church family that he loves and loves him. He's in relationship with these people. They're taking care of his needs. Even from long distance, they're taking care 
of his knees. These people had his back. They paid for, they literally paid for his care while he was in prison. So look what he says about his circumstances. Let's just expand our view for a minute around this scripture. Let's just go to verse 12. Just two scriptures. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it's with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or with little, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. He could do all of this. He could handle all of this, not because of self-confidence. He could handle all of this because God was with him and so were others. I'm confident because Jesus has called me his own, and I'm confident because I have people who are walking with me. And number three is this. Listen, I'm, I'm confident because of who Jesus says I am. Not what others say, what Jesus says. The biggest battle of this generation is identity in Christ. I, I'm, period. Period. Identity in Christ. We did a whole series a while back uh, just talking about the how do we, how do we stand firm in, in our identity in Christ and in our, our beliefs in a culture? How do we love well in a culture that is constantly trying to drag us down and beat us down and is constantly changing, Try, constantly trying to get us to compromise? I'm going to say it as plainly as I can without being rude. Give me some permission here. You will never stand firm in your beliefs and your convictions on your own. You won't do it. You'll change. You'll cave. Something in you will be, will be different. Culture will wear you down. Society will beat you down. Culture will scream at you. Culture will cancel you because of your beliefs. We see it all the time. And so the temptation is in our own confidence, well, I'm just going to be quiet and I'm just going to fly under the radar and I'm going to be an undercover Christian and I'm never going to share my beliefs. I'm never going to invite anyone to Easter service. I'm just going to be copacetic. I'm trying to play it safe because culture is going to tell me I'm a bigot or I'm insensitive or I'm outdated or that you're not good enough, you're not relevant. The only way to stay confident in the face of this conf, uh, con constant opposition is to be firmly rooted in who you are in Christ. Parents, one thing, just one thing, speak identity over your kids. Tell them who they are. Tell them who they are in Jesus. The only confidence comes from truly knowing what who Jesus says we are. So I'm going to just invite you into this moment. We're going to turn this into a worship moment. We're going to bring the lights down, the worship lights down. And I just want you, maybe you can just close your eyes, put your hands out to receive. Can I just for a moment tell you who God says you are? 1 John 3.1 says you are a child of God. Jeremiah 31.3 says that you are God's beloved. Galatians 5.1 says you are free in Christ. Romans 8.1 says that you are not condemned because of your past. Romans 8.15 says that you've been adopted into God's family. Romans 8.17 says now you're a co-heir with Christ. Romans 8.34 that says that Christ himself is at the Father praying for you. Romans 8, 6 says that the peace of God is always with you. Romans 8, 35 through 37 says that you are more than a conqueror through Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says that you are a new creation. The old is gone. We don't need more self-confidence. We need more God confidence. I'm confident because Jesus has called me his own. I'm confident because I have people walking with me in this journey. I'm confident because of who Jesus says I am. I can stay positive. I can stay confident because it's this 
confidence is not based on what I think or feel. Confidence is based on what God has said and done. It's not based on what I think or feel. It's based on what God has said and done. And he says, you're his. So I'm confident. So Father, today we just want to say thank you so much for speaking life over us, for sending your son Jesus to change everything for us, to be a a perfect model of how we can walk out this life of being confident in who we are. And so here we are right now. Our hands are out. We're ready. We're ready. And we love you. We love you, Jesus. As you continue praying all over this room, I, I just know that there's, there's those of you whose, whose weeks have beat you down because of the circumstances that you've been in. And you feel anything but confident. And Jesus is here. The Holy Spirit is here right now in this moment to meet you, to meet you. It just takes one, one step, not even a physical step. Would you just, maybe even just just slip a hand up. No one needs to see it, but just slip a hand up. Jesus, I'm right here and I need you to meet me and to fill me with confidence. Speak that life over me. It's awesome. There's hands going up all over this room right now. It's awesome. And as we keep praying, I I, I can't, I can't let a moment like this, especially reading that scripture from Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus. And that, that's just it. We come to a moment like this and we're confronted with the reality that Jesus absolutely did something for us that we could never do for ourselves. We had this problem called sin. It separated us from God. Humanity as a whole has a problem called sin. It's not comfortable to talk about. A lot of churches don't even talk about it. But we fall short of God's standards. God's standard is perfection. It's holiness. And because of our sinfulness, we're we're separated from God. But he loved us so much. Scripture says God loved us so much. He loved the entirety of humanity so much that he sent his son Jesus to be a perfect sacrifice. He lived a perfect life. He faced every trial, every kind of temptation, every emotion, every problem that would have caused his confidence to be shattered. He faced on our behalf. He never sinned. He never compromised. He never wavered. And he went to a cross to pay the penalty for you. And so here's this moment. We're we're confronted by the reality of who Jesus is. And maybe this is your first time. And this is what we call the good news. The good news is that there's nothing we can do. There's no way we could earn God's favor. And there's absolutely nothing we could do to deserve salvation except for Jesus. And so we're in this moment. And maybe right now you're in that moment of it's the first time I'm going to say yes to Jesus. Or maybe it's been a long time and you're coming back to church for the first time in a long time. Or you're watching online from your home or from your car, whatever it might be. And the Holy Spirit is meeting you in this moment and prompting you it's yes. It's time to say yes to Jesus. And so we just pray alongside you this morning. All you have to do, you don't even have to pray a prayer. You don't have to do anything except say yes to Jesus. We're going to take a few moments and we're going to worship together. Why don't you stand with us today? We're just going to pray. I I just truly believe that there's those that are saying yes to Jesus for the first time. And we're just going to recommit ourselves to Jesus. And then we're going to worship together. Lord, we are right here and we just say yes to you. Thank you for paving the way. Thank you for uh, taking care of the sin problem that we have in our lives. And we trust you with everything that we are. And we say amen. Amen? Amen.